Hey, what's going on, everybody? It is Aaron Trevino here, and we have a terrific guest from beautiful San Antonio. We have Manny Cash. He is the acquisitions manager of Home Buying, Home Selling. How you doing, Manny? Hey, everybody. How you doing, man? It's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here with you and talking to you right now. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm ready for the questions and uh, to deliver value to our, all the people that are going to be watching this video, man. Yes, sir. I, I know we've had it in the work, this in the works for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm happy you came on because I, I know I, I, I was telling you, um, I heard you speak in San Antonio and I, I really enjoyed what you had to say. So I thought thank you'd you. be a great guest. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, man. Yeah. I think we met that uh, that event a few weeks ago, about yeah, almost a month ago. That was a great event. And um, that was just a little, you know, sneak peek of, of, you know, what I got. I got more. But um, yeah, man, I'm glad you liked it and I'm glad you reached out to, to me, buddy. Absolutely. So for those of us who, um, who don't know you, you know, could you introduce yourself? Sure. Yes. My name is uh, Manny Cash. I, I work here with Home Buying and Home Selling, um, you know, lead acquisition manager at the company. So pretty much all the deals, all the leads, all the leads, all the offers, contracts that happens in the, in the office, I pretty much oversee them, right? Uh, making sure numbers make sense, making sure that we get at the right price, making sure that we negotiate the deal with the homeowner, um, you know, we'll go out to see the, the properties. We do a lot of virtual deals in, in, in the old Texas, Houston, Dallas, mainly, uh, some in Austin, El Paso, for sure, Corpus Christi, and of course, San Antonio. So, you know, it requires a, a little experience to evaluate those deals without seeing it. And, you know, I'm luckily and blessed that uh, Michael and Charles, uh, you know, CEOs and owners that, that the company gave me the opportunity to be part of the company. Now I have a position where, Okay, one more time, every deals and every contract that happens in here, I'm involved. Yeah, that's just pretty much me, you know, what I do here at the company. Now, and who I am, my background, where I come from, I come from Venezuela, right? Venezuela, South America. Uh, you know, if you don't know, it's next to Colombia, uh, both Brazil, that's where it's at. Uh, I got to say that because a lot of people don't know, oh, what, what is that? So Really? <laughs> Colombia, both Brazil, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's where I'm from, originally, you know, born and raised until I was 17 years old. And 17 years old, I came to America as a young kid by myself, you know, no family, no friends, no nothing. I just, I didn't even know how to say hello, which is, you know, one, two, three, and that was all I knew. And I uh, moved to Chicago, you know, from, from Venezuela all the way to Chicago, you know, tough city, you know, shy city, man. It's cold city, way colder than Venezuela. <laughs> uh, don't ask me why I, I picked Chicago. I didn't, until now, I don't know why Chicago, but, you know, that was a destination. And, uh, you know, I grind myself up, you know, from, from nothing, from starting the language to, you know, understanding the economy, understanding the culture, understanding people, and then involving myself into a position where I always knew that I was in the country to make it. I was in America, so I have to find a way to make it happen. So always with that ambitious and, you know, mindset of, man, I want more, I want more, I want more. And I knew that in this country, there is no limits. Like, literally, not even the sky is the limit. The limit. You go as much as you want. So when I understood that, I was like, man, I just got to find a way to get there. So long story short, you know, lived in Chicago for three years. Uh, I was going to start my own little company as a cable guy. I was the cable guy um, up there up north. Then I started a little company here in uh, San Antonio with uh, one of the owners. So, you know, got involved with that. That was one of the main reasons why I moved to Texas. Um, then when I found Texas, man, uh, I, I fell in love. Like, it was just so the comparables between Texas and my country, there are a lot of, they're, they're similar, right? Weather, uh, people are nicer, you know, food, right? You know, we got a Tex-Mex food. It's kind of very similar to what I eat. So a lot of things, you know, fell in place where like, oh man, I think I like this state better. I like, I like Texas. I like San Antonio. So, you know, I stay here in San Antonio. Um, and my wife got married here and everything. And then now, you know, uh, after four years living in Texas, uh, man, I'm, I'm making it, I'm making it happen. You know, I'm making it happen. And, and this is it, you know, Texas, the, the, the state in Texas in San Antonio is a city where, um, kind of gave me that push that, that breakthrough right to my career. And, uh, here I am, you know, now dealing with, you know, 10, 15, 20 plus contracts a month, uh, you know, talking about six figures plus a month. Uh, we're talking about, you know, managing a whole 12 plus people, uh, in the office, you know, growing an up, upgrowing company that started from nothing. Now we are in a different six plus markets. So, and I'm, I'm very blessed and, and grateful, you know, for being part of it. 
and being part of the growth and you know proudly can say that you know it's it's the work ethic that we all have put into it and, and and that work ethic i know i have been put into it um so that's just you know a little bit about my background where i came from you know just again one more time just a regular kid you know 17 year old just getting out of high school um you know i was a soccer player i thought i was gonna make it in soccer uh when i was 14 i moved to argentina lived in argentina for a while went went back home finished high school and i just literally told my dad i'm, I'm going to america so if you notice, Argentina is all the way in the whole continent. It's the last country of the whole continent. So I went from all the way from the south to now all the way to the north. So, yeah. Wow. You've been all over, Manny. Yeah, yeah. Pretty much, man. When I went to Colombia, I mean, yeah, I've been, been, been visit, you know, a few countries. And even here in the state, man, um, a, lot of, a lot of cities like, like you know, of course, Chicago, Seattle, uh, you know, Washington, D.C., New York, Atlanta, I mean, you name it. Right, just traveling and hustling, man. Mainly the person of those uh, those uh, purpose of me going to those cities, which is it was just because I was going after that money, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, beautiful, man. So I'm just curious, you know. I mean, obviously, you know, you were a, a young kid when you came over. That's a big step to make. And you um, know, when you were talking about kind of getting used to the culture here in the United States, learning about the economy, the customs, what were you doing to learn about those things? Great question, man. A lot of people, you're actually, I think the second person that asked me that, uh, Charles was one of the first ones that asked me, why were you learning about the economy? Why were you learning about the culture? Why were you learning about how I'm, so the reason why the question is because I knew, again, I knew that, man, I, I just was just praying that immigration would let me get in when I came to uh, America. Because remember, I came by myself and I was a minor. And truth be told, they wouldn't let me get in. Nobody knows this, by the way. I'm, this is the first time I'm, I'm saying it. No, um, uh, the immigration in Miami, they wouldn't let me get into the country. Like they locked me up for about 10 hours. They locked me up for 10 hours. There's something called a cuartito. Um, for those of you that, that are come from another country, you know what I'm talking about. They push in another room, man. And it's like, a, and they go, they, they mess with your brain, man. Like they going hard background check, who you come from, your family, right? So I was just praying like, man, just get me get past this guy, God, like just get me past this. Like I know once I get past this, um, you know, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be okay. So when, you know, finally they let me go to Chicago, um, I was like, man, I made it. Like that was it. That was the hardest part, making into America, getting to be here, right? And to answer your question, bro, I, I, I told myself, okay, Manny, you, you don't know the language, you don't, know, you don't have any families, any friends, but at least you're in America. At least you got an opportunity. At least you have a, a chance to do something. Because, you know, I come from a third world country, man, where everything is limited. Like, you know, coming from socialism, lifting socialism, where you go to the store, it's just one brand, one cereal. Like, it's just so limited. Life is so limited over there. So when I was over here and I went to the store, Walmart, I was like, man, I'm seeing everything. I'm like, okay. Well, why is there a lot of things here in America? So that's what kind of got my, my, um, you know, curiosity of, okay, well, let me see why is America America? And that was the first question that I asked myself. Let me find out why. So then I went back to the history. I went back, back, back in the history and started in with the Rockefellers, the Andrew Carnegie's, the, the JP Morgan's. I started with uh, um, the, whatchamacallit, um, the Henry Ford's, right? So I was like, okay, let me see where America started being America. I'm not talking about the Lincolns. I'm not talking about the president. I'm talking about the economy, the actual business aspect of why is America is so capitalism, right? Because America, let's be honest, America is a capitalism country. But truth be told, it's one of the best, it may, in my opinion, the best country in the world just because the economy system. So when I started studying that, starting with the Rockefeller back in the 1800s, I said, huh, okay, it makes sense. They just, you know, they're business people. They make money. They, 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 they you know, they, they, yeah, they do care about the people. But they also care about, you know, me, them being successful. They care about their family being successful. So long story short, um, you know, I also learned about the IRS and like why the IRS came up, came about. Why do people pay taxes in America? Why is called the IRS? So, which, you know, I, I hope you guys are watching this. You're going to look into that, right? A lot of people don't know why is the IRS the IRS. So, and then, and then I go, okay, well, now I understand a little bit of why we got to pay taxes, we got to pay state taxes, why the business, the business people 
has, has more benefit when it comes to paying taxes. And now why us, real estate people, we have more benefit on, on real estate, right? When it comes to paying taxes. So all those things I, I've been studying, man, like in books and, and, you know, videos, YouTube, right? Um, of course, with Charles, Charles is a big, big fan of history. So then when I started putting, you know, two plus two together, it kind of makes sense. Okay, if I want to be somebody here in America, it's not, it was just not just about going to college and getting a degree, which is, that was a route that my, that one wanted me to get. And which I actually did went to college, but man, I dropped out like in the first, the first semester. I said, no, this is not me. So <laughs> I understood that if I wanted to make it here, if I wanted to be somebody, wanted to build a name for myself, I have to become an entrepreneur. I have to become a businessman. Not because just I wanted to, it's just because that's how the system's made in America. The system was built for businessmen, for entrepreneurs, was built for you to make money. It wasn't built for the nine to five. It was built, yes, you know, they built that all their nine to five be secure, which was Henry Ford. Henry Ford was the one that came up with that. Hey, why is Rockefeller working, having their employees working a hundred hours a week when I can pay to the same thing and only work 40 hours a week? For people that don't know that, he was the main person that came up with that rule. The 40 hours a week, you know, Monday to Friday, get Saturdays and Sundays off right um only eight hours a day so you know by me understanding all that i knew in what position i needed to be at okay do i want to be on the 40 hours a week or do i want to be on the entrepreneurial mindset where i can make my own money and can get my own paycheck see so and another another thing true be told i've never worked hourly i've been living in the u.s for eight years already never worked hourly always made my own money based on a skills or, or a service that i sell or a service that i provide so you know, knowing if, if you want to look back, I've never used my social. I've never gone to, hey, let me, I want to work. I've never done that. So um, I understood from, from a very young age that, okay, I need to learn the skills. That's when the skill of sales came in place, the skill of selling, right? Understanding sales, understanding the mindset of people, understanding the sales psychology and not just the sales psychology, but the buying psychology. And then, man, before I know, I, I, I got into, into sales by default. I was, I was just looking for a job and somebody took me to the mall and said, Hey, I know somebody that can get you a job at the mall real quick. Uh, one of the kiosks. I'm like, sure. Yeah. I need, I need anything. Yeah. But it's only commission. I'm like, yeah, let's go. Man, before I know, dude, I was good at it. Like I was good. I was good at talking to people. I, I was good at stopping people, you know, trying to sell these people stuff and I will make sales, man. And I was like, okay, I think I like this. And before I know, man, I'm like, okay, I'm getting confidence. I'm getting, you know, like I, I I'm only studying. I'm going, now I'm going crazy. Now I'm going on to like, let me read books about sales. And I started reading OGs, man. We're talking about Brian Tracy. Pretty much all the books that you could ever imagine about, about Brian Tracy's, the art of selling, sales success, audio books, uh, videos on YouTube, man. I went nuts on selling. Then Grant Cardone came along, and then 10X. And then before I know, bro, like I, I just, now I understood the sales psychology of a human being, the, the sales process, right? With, with sales, we either sell by emotions, by feelings, or just because we just don't have anything to do and we just spend the money. So, and that's when I became good at it, man. And, and, and then I said, okay, well, let me take my, my sales experience from the mall to 10X. Let me 10X it, right? And then that's when I started looking into real estate. And then real estate really took it from the next level. And I'm telling right now, I'm looking for the next level, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's neat how you were able to make that transition from, from the mall and yep. a lot of those lessons, it sounds like they translated to where you are now. Yeah. It, it, honestly, man, now that I'm looking back, see, like, because when you're doing it, you, you, you're not really paying attention. You just do it. Like, I, I just do it. Uh, but now that you and I are talking and, and I'm telling you all this, I'm looking, I'm looking three years, four years back. I'm like, wow, I'm where I'm at now. I'm a, I'm a, a strong believer in God. I believe that God also uh, has put people in place, have put opportunities in place, right? Have put, um, you know, uh, yeah, opportunities and people in place that can help me to where I'm at. But also because I forced myself to put myself in that position and that position. So, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So kind of, if you could maybe go back to a few of the lessons that you learned at the mall that translate to yeah. where you are now, what were some of those lessons? Man, some of the lessons were never give up in sales. Cause now let me, let me explain myself. For example, when I was at the mall, you know, you have to either you sell or if you sell, you make money. If you don't sell, Hey, sorry, you didn't make money. So, you know, at the kiosk, what I was selling was, Dude, I was selling a, a hard product, like a product that nobody wakes up in the day and say, I'm going to go buy this. 
I was selling TENS unit. TENS unit are those machines that you put on your, on your shoulder, on your neck, and it vibrates, you know, for pain and stuff like that. Like kind of what chiropractor sells. So that's what I was selling. So, you know, I had to stop. And I even had my KPIs, everything. Dude, I knew that for every 10 clients that I'll stop, I will make one sale. So my job was, dude, and it was from most hours, you know, most hours from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. All day. So I knew that I had to stop at least 10 people to make one sale. So the, the, the lesson of that, to answer your question, was, hey, never give up. Just in sales, you're always going to get rejected. I learned how to take rejections like nothing. Like, people re reject me nowadays, and I'm like, whatever, man. Like, it's, it's, another, it's another day. It's like another, it's another day for me. It's, an, it's, it's part of the process. When somebody tells me no, when somebody rejects me, when somebody, it's part of the process. I understand that. Um, and when I took that and I applied it into real estate, and I was like, okay, well, I know that I'm going to be rejected, and I know that I'm being rejected before a bigger payday, for a bigger check, for a bigger, you know, opportunity. And that's what kind of, I took it light. It took me, that's why it took me eight months, eight months, bro. Eight months to, to just get my first deal in real estate, you know, and I was okay with it. And I was willing to, I was just willing to just keep going and keep going until, until it happens. But then when it actually happened and it closed and finally, and I got the check on my hands, I was like, okay, now it's worth it. Let's go. It's game time. It's game time. The, the hard part has been over. And then since that moment, on, man, forget it, bro. I was just like, like, like on the roll, man. It just, I've closed and closing, closing after closing after closing, contract after closing, after contracts. And before I know, I said, okay, rejection, it's just, I understand rejection. It's part of the process. So for those of you that are watching and, and whatever you're doing, you're doing real estate, you're doing loans, you're call calling, whatever you're doing and it requires sales, just understand that being rejected is part of the sales process. So that's the biggest takeaway I ever taken. Absolutely. You know, yeah. for some people, it's it's very hard to kind of get used to that because yeah. you know no one likes being rejected. How, you know, for someone who is kind of dealing with that, how do you how do you deal with rejection? Dude, dude, you know, like when somebody tell me, man, on the example, I have my guys here, like, man, I get rejected over the phone, bro, like over the phone, dude. Like, you know what was hard, dude? Stopping somebody at the mall and telling you in your face, don't talk to me right now. I'm walking. You know, screw you, don't touch me, or right? like on your face. Dude, that's just stuff, you know? Because now you're feeling it, you're seeing it, you're like, oh man, like, you know, and you're getting that minimum, minimal 20, 30 times a day at the mall. So when you get home, bro, like you get you just get drained, like, man, nobody wants me, type of deal. You see? Now, when you get on the phones, like call calling, or for example, and I'll take it what I do, call calling, man. When I started call calling, I was like, man, this is too easy. All they got to do is just know. That's it. Bye. And they don't even know who I am. They don't even see me. And I don't see their reaction. You see? So to answer your question, man, it's just don't look forward for the yes. Look forward for the no's. Why? Because you know in this business or in any business, again, that requires sales, car, car salesmen, they get a lot of people's walking, right? Like the shoppers, hey, I want to want to see this car. For example, last week, I went to, see, went to Mercedes. I wanted to see a car. I didn't buy it. But for that salesman, I was elite. I, I am elite, right? But I'm I'm more I'm I'm part of his process. I'm part of his KPIs, and that's okay. That's normal. Just understand that in sales, you're gonna get more no's, more negativities than actual positive uh, reaction. But that's why we do this because we we are conscious. You have to be conscious that even though you get rejected a hundred times, once you get that yes, the payday is gonna be way better. You see, the rewards is better, and that's why all we choose sales. Absolutely, yeah. well said. So when you talk about the sales process, generally, you know, could you talk about maybe, you know, the steps of your process or generally what a sales process looks like? Sure, sure. So um, in general, in general, I'm not talking about just real estate in general, whether you're buying a, a jacket, right, that acquires if somebody sells to you, whether you're buying a wash that somebody's selling to you, whether you're buying a car that somebody's selling to you, whether you're buying something that people are trying to sell you, um, or that you're trying to sell to somebody, life insurance, whatever, you have to go, you have to understand that we as a human being, we have emotions, we have feelings. So we, we buy either by feelings or by, you know, emotions, right? Right then the, the moment there are, what I used to do, what I will, I will do my best, my best to make that person in front of me. I had a five second window in the mall to sell somebody. So I do my best to make that person so comfortable, so comfortable to the point where like we could joke, we could, we could tell we we could um 
you know, curse to each other to a point where like, we're okay, like we're cool. So it's always building that trust at the beginning, building that trust, right? Where the client, the homeowner, or the, yeah, the client, the customer is comfortable with you that by the time you ask the price or by the time you say, okay, what's the million dollar question? How much is it? By the time that question comes out, it's okay for you to say a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, a hundred thousand because you already built that report. So I guess what I'm trying to say is always build that report with the homeowner or with your client. So by the time you talk numbers, it's easier. It's easier for you to negotiate. And also, um, you know, just to see who you're dealing with. If you're dealing with somebody that's way older than you, like say, you know, 75, 80 years old, you know, trying to understand that, hey, they're already in a different position where you have to start, you know, talk slower, you know, understand their, their, their point of view, put yourself on their position, right? Always put yourself on the homeowner's position, on the client's position. Um, if you're talking to somebody that's more direct, always try to mimic, always try to mimic either the character, their tonality, and how hard they're looking. If they're close, close-handed, you close your hand, you know, and then you open them up, open them up, right? Over the phone, we cannot do that because we cannot see each other. But what, guess what we can do? And we can, we can match tonality. We can match some other people's tonality based on how they're talking. If they're talking fast, if they're talking slow, if they're talking loud, if they're talking low, right? So for example, if you're on the phone, you're making a call call and you get a homeowner or a client that is on the rush. Hey, hey, yeah, how can I help you right now? I'm kind of busy. Hey, Mr. Sully, I don't want to take too much of your time. Are you have five, five minutes? No, I don't. Okay, let me call you right back. You don't want to interrupt somebody just, just because you want to make a sale. Make it the most comfortable for you and for your client. So two bullet, two bullet points, build report, build good report, match the tonality, man. And I'm, I, you know, I can promise you that, um, that is going to be easier for you to make a sell. Absolutely. So, you know, when you're saying building rapport, I'm sure that's tough to do, you know, whether you're in the mall or whether you're over the phone, you only have a few seconds to do that. How do you build that rapport quickly? Good. It's easier to build it in person. It's easier to do. When I was in the mall, man, it was super easy, bro. Cause I can, I can build rapport based on, man, a nice, a nice jacket, dude. Where do you get it from? That's it. It's over. And the moment you tell me, Oh, I got it from, let's say, I don't know, Sara or whatever store you buy. I got it. From, oh man. Nice. Dude. That's a nice, that's a nice store. I buy over there too, man. What else do you buy there from? You know what I'm saying? That's easy. On person is easy. Now over the phone, it's a little more tricky because you gotta, you gotta find, you get, you build rapport based on, on, for example, on my, on my career, on my uh, area, which is talking to people for, uh, for, pro for, for, for properties, homeowners, I build rapport based on the why they want to sell. Mr. Sully, I'm kind of curious. It looks to be a good property. Why would you even consider selling it? I don't understand. See, you reverse psychology. I mean, I'm call calling them because I want to buy it. And then all of a sudden, I'm telling them I'm confused. I don't understand why you want to sell it. So the homeowner is like, I, I don't understand, man. You call me because you want to buy it. Now you're asking me why I want to sell? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. But then what, what does happen is the homeowner usually tells you the why. Well, I want to sell because I need to move. Okay, where are you moving? I'm moving to Dallas. Okay, what's going on in Dallas? Is it a family member or is it job related? You see? So based on what they're telling you, you're going to spark conversation. That's at least for us here in our office, at least how I do it when I talk to homeowners. I spark a good conversation based on the why they want to sell, the why they want to do something. And whatever that why is, I just relate with it, bro. One thing is, guys, always be relatable. If the homeowner says, hey, man, Manny, I think the sun is blue today. You know what, Mr. Sully? I agree with you. I see, I, I don't know why people are saying it's yellow and orange. I see a blue too. But hey, back to the property. Why would you even consider selling? You see? So relate with them. Relate with them. I agree with them. And keep moving forward on your sales process. Absolutely. So just curious as well, kind of off that. I mean, would you ever you know, disagree with the customer? Like if they said, for example, if they said that the sun was blue, would you say, no, the sun's red? No, no, you, you don't, you know? I mean, let's be honest. You, you and I know it's not, it's not blue, you know? Like it's just common sense. It's not blue. But why would I want to get the homeowner a potential sale to get it on my, on my wrong side when, I mean, I know it's, I know it's not blue. Hey, no, I agree with you, Mr. Sully. I think, I think it's blue. I think actually people are tripping. They're saying it's red, but hey, I see it blue today. I agree. Just agree. You know, just agree with the homeowner. Now there are things that like, for example, price, right? Don't just some point say, well, I think my house is worth half a million. I mean, well, Mr. Selleck, will you tell me a little bit more? Why will you say something like that? 
do you have some statement? What, what can buy your statement saying that your, your property is worth half a million? Do you have a backup? Well, you know, there's, there's ways that you can confront them, right? But what I always like to do is the first word that comes out of my mouth is, I agree with you, Mr. Seller. I agree with you. You know what? Is that is your property. You can put the price that you want to it. But let me tell you what the market is telling me. The market is telling me right now that your property may be worth 350000 See, I agree with them. But then I'm going to tell you what the market is telling me. So that way, who is the, who is the bad guy? No, Manny. It's the market. Yeah. I'm never the bad guy. It's, man, it's, it's the market. You see? Same thing when I make offers. When I make offers, I don't say, I'm... Hey Aaron, I need to I need to buy this property at fifty thousand. It's never coming from me. Hey Aaron, look, I'll tell you this: your property in X Y Z condition. You told me it needs this and this that. Um, you you told me you need to sell because of this and this and that. I'll tell you this: look, I'm looking at the area right now. It looks like the properties are selling and as is cash, uh, for about forty five fifty thousand dollars. Well, is that because you are saying this, many? No, I'm not saying it. I'm not saying, Mr. Aaron. I'm saying it because I'm looking at my computer right now, and the market is telling me that in the last two months, there's properties just similar as like you sold for forty five, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. Now, who is it coming from? Is it coming from me? No. It's coming from the market. See? So you have to understand and to differentiate yourself from the good guy and the bad guy. You never want to be the bad guy. You always want to be the good guy when it comes to the customer. Absolutely. So, you know, kind of still talking about price a little bit, you know, when someone, when you mention that price, when you build that rapport, the time comes and you name that price and they say, well, Manny, stop, that's too high. How do you, you know, wh what do you say when someone says that the price is too high? Well, in my area, uh, usually they don't say that. They, they say it's too low because remember, I, I, lo I make low offers, right? Remember, I, I don't buy uh, a market value. I buy at a discount. So usually what they tell me is, hey, uh, I think that I think the offer is too low. Hey, I understand, Mr. Seller. Again, the reason why I'm saying this is because that's what the market is telling me. That's what my financial department are buying properties in that area for. I don't. That doesn't mean it's your property because I haven't seen it yet. But once I see it, I may be able to offer you a little bit more. But that's the ballpark figure where we may need to be at. So, pretty much, I just I acknowledge that, but I pivot. I pivot. I always go to different route. Hey, it's not me. It's the market or it's the financial department. So long story short, I also make you understand, okay, Mr. Seller, what would you even consider? Let's just say I need to be at 40, 50,000 and they're at 80. Okay, we're getting somewhere, Mr. Seller. You're at 80, I'm at 40. Let's just say I'm at 50. Is there any wiggle room there in your end that we can work together? I just want to work with you, Mr. Seller. Tell me, is, if, is it possible for me to, is, is it worth it for me to drive, to go to my, my boss office right now and say, hey, if we do 65, I think Mr. Aaron would move forward today. Is it, is it possible to say that, Mr. Aaron? You see, and I get commitment. If, if I fill in the home one and say, yeah, we know what, if we can meet in the middle somewhere, we got a deal. Okay, perfect. But see, when you're negotiating with somebody, you always have to have leverage. You always have to have leverage. Never leave. I also read this book with, uh, the, you know, the president right now, Donald Trump, um, The Art of the Deal. The Art of the Deal is whatever, all I got from the book is, I think it's like 200 pages. What I got from the book was you always have to make a win-win uh, deal. You always have to make a win-win situation for both parties, for whoever you're doing business with, and of course yourself. You never want to be on the on the lower hand. You always have to be in the middle with the, the client, homeowner, whoever you're dealing with. Never and also never be that person or that salesman that always trying to win everything. So always trying to be, make a fair deal for both parties. So long story short, if I'm giving you the mouse, you make sure you give me the AirPods. You see, if I'm giving up something, I want to make sure you're giving up something. So that's when, it, that's when the negotiation comes with me in the middle, or hey, are we willing to work together? I wanna work with you. What's the best we could do? See? So. Sure. Absolutely. So, you know, let's say, you know, I'm, uh, you know, we're talking on the phone and you say, hello, Mr. Aaron, how you doing? And then, you know, your client uh, or your prospect cuts you off and says, uh, oh, I can't talk right now. Um, I'm in a hurry, blah, blah, blah. Um, send me more information. Great. Yeah, and that's, I like those. I like those. So great, Mr. Aaron, what I'll do is I'll send you a text, my personal number, homeowner, uh, company's information, and then I'll follow up with you tomorrow. And that's what I do, you know. I, I never want to, I, I don't want to force a sale. And again, I've done in the past, uh, Aaron, being honest with you, where even when I was at the mall, even here in real estate, uh, I already learned from my hard lessons, uh, I force a sale. When I force a sale, usually those are the tough ones. And the mall, when you force a sell, those are the refunds. Those are the ones that come back and like, hey, you know what? Let me get my money back. So, you know, why would you force somebody 
to do something where you know it in the beginning that we're not comfortable at doing. Same thing when, I, when I'm dealing with houses. I'm dealing with houses, bro, like real estate. In the mall, I was selling $150, $250 products. Now I'm dealing with $150,000, $200,000, see? And it's actual real estate. So I don't, wanna, I don't even want the homeowner to one day, to say two years on the road, put a comment on Facebook or somewhere, oh, I, I sold my house because I was forced by this guy or I was forced by this company. So what I like to do is I like to put myself in a situation where homeowner, I'm here just to help you. I'm here. If you need a solution, just call me, right? If you're not ready, that's fine. Just call me whenever you're ready. And that's when the follow-up campaign comes in, in, in place and then we do our follow-up you know, process. Absolutely. So, you know, a lot of times these initial contacts are a bit more simple, but um, you know, how, what's your follow-up process like? How do you kind of suggest people do that? Good question. So a uh, rule of thumb, guys, rule of thumb for everybody that's watching is if somebody is, a, is, a, is a, if a, prof, a prospect tells you, hey, call me in a month, you're going to call it in two weeks. Call me in two months, you're going to call it in one month. Long story short, if the prospect tells you to call in at one time, you're going to call it half of the time that they tell you. Why, Aaron? Why? Because remember, they got life. They got, they're probably married. They, they got kids. They got work. They got bills to do. They got a lot of, they got a lot of stuff to do. See, and they forget. They forget. Now we don't because we're into the we are, we are in the business, and we have our own CRM that can let us know. Hey, follow up with this, follow up with that, make a call, make a text. So, with when, with clients, remember they they might tell you call me next week, but then tomorrow they may forget about you. So what I like to do is I like to call in half of the time, half of the time that they tell me, and the follow up process goes something like this: I follow up in the mornings with a call. The more the call doesn't go through, I leave a voicemail. After the voicemail, I call back. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't go through again, I leave a text. And then I know, you know, most of the Americans, they work nine to five. I know by five, five thirty, they should be already getting getting home. And at five thirty or six, I'm calling back. And I'm doing another I do another call back or another text. That way I'm always in in their voicemails or in their text messages. Sure. You know, I think that's interesting as well. The text messaging is that, yeah. you know, are you calling from an office line or from your, your personal cell phone? And then you I have a, yeah, I have a business uh, sideline for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, I'm, I'm just curious because it seems like five years ago, people weren't wanting to be texted by businesses. Whereas yeah. now people are open to that. Yeah. People are now more open to that, bro. Like it's crazy. We have got contracts um, from homeowners in Houston, Dallas, where even the negotiation happened on text. Like, it was weird, dude, on text. Like, literally, we're talking negotiation on text. Well, give me 100. No, I'm, I'm going to need to be at 80. Well, no, meet me in the middle, somewhere, something like that, all everything on text. So, yes, um, the market, even the human being aspect when it comes to, again, selling, right? Selling. You see how we're shifting from now more technology? Now we're shifting from now instead of going to the mall or instead of going to a title company or, or a realtor, I can trust somebody on text to buy my property. So again, it all comes down to the, this human psychology and where we're going, where we're going, uh, where we're going with this. And that's going to happen in 10, 15 years from now when you and I are, you know, 35, 40, right? Who, let, guess who, who that generation is going to be? That's going to be us. We're going to be that generation that's like, yeah, just text me, dude, or just send me a voicemail or call me. Right. So we're more technology uh, savvy. Now, when you're dealing with, again, with the 65 plus, 65 plus, now you have to deal more in person because remember the, 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 the time that they grew up, right. They grow more, you know, man to man, shaking hand type of deal, sideways type of deal. You know, I got to see you, you know, it's a different, right. So we have to understand what the market, even the, the market when buying or selling are the human being is going to. See, a lot of, a lot of sales are happening right now online. Do you think about this more than ever, more than ever now with this Corona thing. See, so Amazon, why do you think Amazon is one of the biggest, biggest, big, the number one company in the whole world? Because that they, they are confident. They make the home, the, the client comfortable and confident in the phone that their, their money is secure by Amazon, by a refund or whatever is going to happen. So that's when you're doing a business, in this case, real estate in our, in our aspect, we get a lot of contracts in SMS, which is send SMS campaigns and they come back with, yes, I want to sell, make me an offer. So. Absolutely. Could you, could you kind of expand a bit more on the SMS campaigns? Because I, I'm not very familiar with those. Sure. So we do use a, a software, a software called the, the smarter, a smarter contact, the smarter contact. And what they, what it does is 
you know, if you're a realtor, you know how you have your whole list of follow-ups or prospect that you have. What you could do, Aaron, is you get that list, you upload it to a software. It's actually a computer. You upload it to the software, and then by a click of the button, that's it. By a click of the button, you can target. Teddy, you there? Teddy here? Because Teddy's the one that does that. I think it's a target up to 250 people per hour. 250 wow. people per hour. So we're texting 250 people per hour in, in houses like that, like, like it's just in one click. So the software, what it does is um, it takes out all the, the lane lines and it takes out all the, like say all the negative person, oh, take me off your list, take me this, wrong number. And it only going to filter the actual motivated ones to say, yeah, make me an offer. I want to sell or how much you offer. Or, well, yes, I want to sell, you know, how does this work? things like that. And then we start getting into more qualification process. And then once we get somebody that's actually motivated to, to go, which is pick up the phone at the end of the day, brother, you got to talk to people. You got to call them back, you know? Yeah, absolutely. This is definitely something kind of new for, you know, not only the older generation, but also, you know, for a lot of younger people, because yeah. this is pretty new. I and mean, even a yeah. few years ago, we didn't have this. Mm -hmm. I know. So uh, also, you know, what other sort of uh, email campaigns do you do? Like, like when you're following up? Yeah. So whenever we're following up with clients, we don't follow up with them on email. We follow up with them on text and voicemails. They're big. They're huge. Ringlet voicemails, right? Where they just ring one time. And then by the time the whole morning is trying to pick up the phone, it's already hang up and it will leave a voicemail. A, a set of voicemail, you know, from us saying, hey, this is Manny again with calling you back on the property at one, two, three main street, we talked so-and-so or, Hey, this is Manny. Um, I know it's completely out of the blue. I wanted to see if you consider selling the property. Right. So, uh, when it comes to email campaign, we only do email campaign for our, our, our cash buyers. I always side of the business, which are our clientele. They want to buy the inventory for, uh, for us. When it comes to the customer phase, it's calls. Uh, we do also, um, handwritten letters. Those work, those work perfect for older people because remember, all older generation, right? A different generation, 60s, 50s, right? 70s, hey, just send me a mail. So we send in a mail. We're sending a thank you letter. Hey, thank you for getting my phone call. This is Manny. This, and we're sending a business card. Call me back whenever you have a chance and we talk about this property. See, so you have to also understand your demo demographics, right? Who are you talking to? Who are you targeting to? Are you targeting 20 to 30? Are you targeting from 50 to 60? Who are your demographic? What are they using? Where are they in social media? Are they on Facebook, Instagram? Where are they? So that's how we're targeting. Yeah, that, that's definitely really important, kind of knowing your audience and being able mm -hmm. to transition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like, for example, you know, our company, Home Buying Home Selling, you know, we are in the space of two different spaces. We are into the, 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 the customer phase, which is homeowner, and also we are into the um, entrepreneurial business, real estate person that wants to learn real estate, the education real, uh, aspect of the business, right? People that want to learn what I do, just call, simply call calling, man. I get reached out by a lot of people, Manny, I want to learn call calling, teach me or, you know, mentor me or things like that. So we are also into that space. A lot of people learn, want to learn about fix and flip, wholesaling. We are also into that aspect, right? So we have to also retarget those people a different way that we retarget um, homeowners. Absolutely. So in terms of cold calling, you know, how many cold calls are you making per day? So we're, we're doing uh, per day. So we're doing about a hundred thousand calls a week. Wow. hundred thousand calls a week. So we divided that by uh, five, five days. So we're looking at 20,000 calls a day. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And keep in mind those calls, these calls are made here in the U S and they're also, they're being made from the Philippines because we have virtual assistants. Uh, that as right now we speak, they're working and they're, ca they're calling p homeowners here in Texas from the Philippines. So they're the ones that are kind of pre-qualifying these calls and then? Yeah. So the way we have it set up is yes, they, they pre-qualify these calls, right? They just get it. They just get a motivated person. A, a homeowner says, yes, I want to sell, make me an offer. They already have a script that they got to go through to just to determine that, that that lead is a good lead. Because remember, not every lead is a good lead. Every lead is a lead, but not every lead is a good lead. And not every good lead is it will be a contract. So look at the process one more time. I'm gonna say it slowly. Every lead, yes, it can be a good lead, but every lead, not every lead is a good lead. And not every good lead can be a good can be a contract. And not every contract 
can be a good contract. So that it has to it has to be on those funnels. It has to meet the same criteria, right? Why? Because we, sometimes we get into contracts where where the you know there's just title problems, title issues. You know, so many dead people. Um, you know, 20, 25 dead people. That man, you gotta go to you know the other side of the world to find it. So to answer your question, yes, the, the VA is what they're doing is they pre-qualify. They send it to the U.S. here in our CRN that we have, and then our guys here and myself, which is get on the phones after and say, "Hey, you talked to one of my associates, Aaron, about a property here, one two three Main Street." Oh yeah, I was talking to him about twenty minutes ago. Well, my name is Manny. I'm one of the financial department or head acquisition, whatever the title is, uh, and I'm here just to determine if you know this property meets our criteria and let's see if we're the right fit for you. How are you doing today? Oh, we're doing wonderful. And then you know we get your spill. Absolutely, absolutely. That that's definitely um, a, a new part of the sales process that, that that you know we didn't have a few years ago either. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Now, a lot of people are leveraging that, which we are. And for you, brother, I mean, since you're a realtor as well, you can leverage that. You can leverage, because remember, our time, it's very limited. As real estate, you know, people, we, we, we're we busy, right? Well, at least I'm busy. I'm busy 24 hours, man, looking at properties, talking to people. Sometimes I don't really have time to just be prospecting, be prospecting when I know here I already have a big pot of motivated sellers that I, I just got to close. So, if I'm going to spend five hours a day on prospecting, I'd rather spend five hours a day in closing. And I'd rather pay, I'd rather pay, you know, I don't know, $4, $3 an hour, $3 an hour for somebody that is going to prospect for five hours. Now my time became more valuable. Now I don't mind paying for somebody that's going to do the job that I can do, but also I'm killing two birds at once because I'm closing deals on the other, on the other side. Sure. Could you kind of speak more on, uh, you know, leveraging your time? I mean, how, how else can someone leverage their time? Yeah. So that's, that's a good one, right? So we, the way to, um, at least for me, I, I've leveraged my time based on, yeah, getting VAs. VAs have helped me a lot, right? And in my, in my business and here in our business, um, also getting a good business partner, right? For example, on the real estate um, wholesaling slash investor, you know, you got acquisition and you got disposition. You got acquisition where you acquire the deal and disposition where you sell the deal. Um, you know, for a one-man show, it's kind of hard because you got you to gotta be all of that. You got to be your CEO. You got to be your acquisition. You got to be the disposition, transaction coordinated. I mean, you got to be all of that at once. So what I recommend everybody is, hey, man, just find yourself a good business partner that you can partner up with that you guys can split up the task. Right. Because, yeah, you may not make you may not make, I could say, 100 percent of the deal. But what if you now you start doing volume? Because if you make 100 percent of 10,000, it's just 10,000. But what if you can make, let's, let's just say you, you get three deals at 10,000. There you go. Now it's thirty thousand dollars. So I go back to the philosophy, the philosophy of Henry Ford. What did Henry Ford said? And that's what kind of my dad implanted in my head when I was growing up. Henry Ford said, son, I don't know, my dad said, told me son, but Henry Ford said, I'd rather get 1%, 1% of 100 men than 100% of my own effort. Even though, even though I'm paying for that 1%, right? I'm paying labor for that 1%, but I'd rather get it. That, at the end of the day, it will equal to 100%, but I'm, I'm just here chilling, doing my own task. So for those of you guys that are on my show, try to find a good business partner. You know, I know it's hard sometimes trying to find a partner that isn't the same frequency, same same task right send as motivated as you as hungry as you but do your best to find somebody that can that you can work together as a team and then hey let's go let's work you do you do this i do this and i don't, I don't need to worry about what you do because i know you're gonna do it and i don't you don't need to worry about me because i know you know i'm gonna do it so absolutely well said uh i'm just curious as well you know how do you you know when you're talking about you know making your plan leveraging your time how do you plan out your day the way I plan out my day, I plan it in phases. Okay, I plan it in the, in the morning. Uh, I'm be honest with you. I'm not. I'm not gonna tell you. I'm one of those that wakes up at four in the morning and read a book and meditate and and, and go to work out. I'm not those. <laughs> I'm not those. I'm just be honest. I'm not those, man. I, I I like my my at least six six to seven hours of sleep, man. I like my six to seven hours of sleep. So, um, you know, get up comfortable at my time. You know, seven a.m. Get up, take a shower. Uh, when I'm taking a shower, I'm, I'm, I'm always playing a podcast or an audio book. See, that's where I'm leveraging my time. So by, while I'm taking a shower and brushing my teeth, I'm getting ready. And the background, 
He texts me, let's say, it takes me 20 minutes to get ready, 30 minutes. I'm listening to my mind. My subconscious mind is listening to something that is going to help me grow. That's just one. Two, when I get here in the, in the morning in the office, check my emails. I get rid of all the emails that I need to get after, get all my emails done. The first, the first, uh, the first two hours in the morning, I do the hardest tasks. The hardest tasks are the hardest call, right? Which are the one, the follow-ups, calling back your clients, making offers, right? Setting up appointments. So I do the hardest thing in the, in the whole day I do in the morning. In the first two, three hours in the morning. Before noon, I got to be done with the hardest thing which is calls, following up, offers, uh, setting up appointments, checking on my VAs, checking on my guys, I'm done. The second task is, okay, where are we at with the business? What files do we have open? What files do we gotta close? Do we need any paperwork from the homeowner? Let's, now let's get now into actual contract that we already have in escrow. Now, the, 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 around this time, around 4.30 to 7, because I, I finished working around 7, 7.30, it's more around come on like a little admin time. Okay, let me see how the day went with the callers, with the VAs. Let me see how many leads. Let's go back to the, is there any follow? And I get with my guys, is there any offers out? Come on, any contracts out? So I'm doing a little more of admin, admin tasks. So I split it up like that. In the morning, it's me. Then in the middle of the, of the, the day, it's more of the business. And then at the end of the day, more of the, about the team. So that's kind of mix it up a little bit. Sure, absolutely. So are you kind of uh, are you kind of blocking your time? You know, you give thirty minutes, one hour to do different tasks. Or are you? How do you organize that? So um, that's a good that's a good one, man. I, I I don't really do that. I don't really have like a like a time blocker or or, or I put a time on my phone and when the phone rings, I, I gotta stop what I'm doing. No, I am the type of person where that you finish when you get like you finish when you get done. Like I'm done when I'm done. See, I'm, I don't leave here when, until I'm done. So um, the way I'm doing it, it's, I, I'm kind of, I'm aware. I'm very self, I have self-awareness on my day. Like, it's so crazy. Like, I know what's happening around me. So, and I have always a time. I'm always looking at the time. Okay, it's already 12. I, I got to be done. Like, I got to go. I got to go. And when I got to go, meaning I'm, I'm, I'm rushing. Like, I'm going, getting done. And then, okay, now I take a break. They have lunch. And then I know from what time after I have lunch until what time I know what I got to do. So I, can, I guess I kind of train myself in that, that routine that it just comes out naturally. So I don't need like an alarm, alarm, alarm clock to let me, let me know what I'm doing. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Are the, um, you know, is there anything else that you haven't said that you'd like to, you'd like to really just hit home for people? Yeah, man. Um, you know, Aaron, uh, you know, I, I'm blessed to... I'm blessed, man. I'm blessed that uh, that God have again put me in this position right now. Talking to you, man. Like I, talking to you, I'm blessed because there's only very few times that you get to share your your story. Very few times where you get to share, you know, who you are, where you came from, what you're made of, right? And and like I always say, every time I have a moment to 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 speak about it, and I always going to speak about it, it's, guys. I know many, many of the people are going to watch this video are going to be Americans. Are gonna be people from here, right? People that were born here, people that were born and ready with a social security, man. Some people don't even know how important it is having a social security, man. I struggled with that for so long, and you know, it's what I'm trying to say, Aaron, is man, just wake up, right? Like the moment you you feel yourself like, man, I don't think this is for me, or I don't know if I can make it, man. Just get out of your your own comfort zone, man, and, and understand that all those thoughts that you have, they're BS. Because you are in the best country, in the best position right now to make it happen from somebody, an immigrant like me, somebody that's coming from nowhere, man, from nothing, that, that, is, that is making it, and it's because it's possible. And in the United States, one thing that is for sure, man, one, one, one man told me this on a call call, man, and, and when that man told me on a call call, it was about, when I first started, man, about two, two and a half years ago, I call called this dude, he was in California. And, you know, he heard my accent, right? He does and that. He's like, man, where are you from? So then, oh, long story short, we started talking, dude. And I'm telling him, well, I'm from Venezuela and this and that. He's like, you know what, man? I'm proud of you. My, my, my father is from Mexico, you know, and I was born here and I was doing this. And my dad always told me one thing, man. And see, see my dad told me this. And now I want to share it with you. Like, what is it? He's like, look, son, in America, nothing is for sure. Nothing is guaranteed. But only one thing. Only one thing. And I go, what is it? In America, you will always have the opportunity to be who you want, to be what you want, to have as much money as you want, to be as, as big or as little as you want. 
ain't nobody gonna knock on your door to tell you don't do it you always gonna do it because this is it this is the america this is how it is and then when that moment that dude told me i was like man he nailed it like i can be and who and have and be as rich as i want you see and as successful as i want again everybody measures success different but i can be as much as successful as i want and to, to leave to leave you guys with the messages you know, I get it. It's tough, man. It's tough. It's tough. You know, life happens. But understand that here in America, you only need one shot, one opportunity, man. One opportunity can take you to, to the moon. Look at look at what uh, Facebook did. Look at Facebook, dude. This dude from the from the middle of nowhere on on a college dorm, from becoming the one of the youngest billionaire, twenty years old. I think that's what he was when he became a billionaire, right? Look at even 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 Grant Cardone. Like just let's not go with somebody no not too big. Grant Cardone is big, but like Grant Cardone coming out of nowhere, same thing. Look at where he at. So look at people like that. Like man, they came from nothing. Why can't I do do it? You know. And I know so many uh, immigrants that come from all, from my country, from Mexico, from all it, from Russia, bro. In Russia, oh Jewish, right? Like my 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 guys, my guy from the mall. They all from Israel. Man, they all successful. They all millionaires. They're seven figures earners. And when you talk to them, it's like, they're barely stuck English, bro. Like they barely know English. And I'm like, how do you make so much money? It's like, my friend, this is America. This is America. You got one opportunity, you gotta make it. So then me, you know, being associated with those people, I'm like, man, you're right. I gotta make it, I gotta make it, I gotta make it. So I guess my mindset is a little bit different, right? It's more of like an immigrant type of hardworking mindset. And I just, the, the, what I wanna share to everybody, every, every American, man, just forget about, uh, you know, bullying, fuck all that shit. Just get to work, man. Get to work and make it happen. You know, that's it. That's it. That's Absolutely. it. Bro. There, there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah, man. Yeah, and I, I get, I, I can feel you. I, I don't know if you can feel my passion, man. I get, I get passionate about this. Like I do, I really do, because I know that God is giving me again one more time the opportunity to speak about it, right? And one day I'll speak about it in the bigger stage, in the bigger audience. And I know that's going to impact so many people's lives. Um, because sometimes we, we take it for granted, dude. We take it for granted that just by the fact that we have water in our, in our house, man. Dude I, dude, I come from a country where, like, you have water two times a week to take a shower. Two times a week to take a shower. And then here people are bitching because it's because there's traffic. You know, like, come on, look, just, just, just get to work, man. You got everything you need. You got everything you need, and even if you got everything you need, you got so you got um unemployment right there in the corner that you can call and just they take care of you. So what's the excuse? There's no excuse. There's no excuse. Oh, fuck the 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 politician. Forget about the politician. Make it about yourself. You know, and that's my message, man, for all of you guys. I know I got a little bit aggressive and and, and motivated, but I'm sorry. You know, that's just me. That's how I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, man. No, no, man. Don't don't apologize. We uh, we, we all need that, really. Yeah. So, yeah, man. That's always my message, man, for everybody. Even my guys here, man. They know me. Like when when, when I see everybody here, my guys like, hey, you know, kind of. I'm like, hey, man, get up. Come on. I don't want to hear. It. I don't want to hear. It. You know. I don't want to hear. It. No shit. I'll buy you a ticket. Go back home. There's my room there. Shit. My mom, will, my mom will take you there, and you will see in two weeks. You're like, no, I want to go back, and you will see how much you appreciate, how much you can appreciate the stuff that you got over here. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Could you talk a bit more? Um, you almost kind of reminded me a bit of. I don't know if you ever see Gary V a little bit. Yeah, yeah, of course, Gary V. Uh huh. Yeah, I mean, he talks a little bit about the immigrant mentality. Could you kind of maybe explain a bit more about that? Yeah. So look, man. Look, when we come over here, bro. Right, I'm talking in general for all the immigrants, right? And and um, when we come to this country, we come with a. It's crazy because America in America is different than American outside. When we're looking from the outside in, do America is like, like wow, like you know the Hollywood has done a great job. I can tell you that Hollywood has done a great job. CNN has done a great job on building America from the outside. Like America from the outside is the best. Is like. No problems, bro. Like, there's no problems. When you're here, you're like, when I started leaving here, I'm like, man, okay, it looks like, you know, okay, it's good, like in the movies, but man, you got to work your ass up. Like, you got you to gotta put in the work, right? So when we come over here, you know, we come with the mindset of, man, I got to work. I got to work. I got to work. Why? 
Let me tell you why. For example, in Venezuela, Venezuela, dude, it's hard for somebody to evictions. Man, ain't no evictions, dude. Like, like it's hard for somebody to kick you out of your house. You know, oh, like, oh, they're gonna cut up your light because you didn't pay the light bill. That shit don't happen. You know, they're gonna, you, that, you know, the life already cut up, bro. Like, the life goes off and now, like, every, every two days, bro. Like, it's normal. But here, check this out. I gotta work because I gotta pay my bills. Because if not, guess what? The, the, the electricity company is gonna cut it up. They don't give a shit. I gotta work because, you know, they're gonna cut out the water. I gotta work. If not, they're gonna, if I don't pay one month, in the next month, I get an eviction letter. What, do you, what does that mean? Shit, I gotta, I gotta, they don't get out of it. I gotta, I gotta work, right? I gotta get to work. So, it's more of a, uh, man, in my country, I couldn't pay the bill and nobody would have happened out here if I don't pay. I know, I know I'm going to be kicked out, so I got to get to work. I got to make something happen. Now, the other aspect of immigration, right? Remember, we come over here. Luckily, I can't, everything with all my papers right. I came, you know, with the airport, visa, here you go, legal, everything. Came with the right way. But then... It's hard, again, as I told you, it's hard to have a social security when you come as an, I came as a student, which is a F1 visa. An F1 visa, dude, they don't give you social security. They just tell you this, the American government is so tough that they expect you to come and then just figure it out. Figure it out. Either your parents have money back home to send you or, you know, just figure it out. You know, and then they said, what about the people that cross the border? Not even social, not even nothing, not even documents. So, when we come over here, we're like, man, it's tough. It's tough to just, you know, when you know you cannot go to a restaurant or you can go to a regular nine to five and be like, hey, I want to work. When they ask you the documents, you don't have it. So what is that? That forces you, at least it forces me to get out of my comfort zone and be like, okay, well, if they're not allowing me to work there because I don't have the documents, then I, that means I got to buy this at Walmart for $1 and I got to sell it on the street or somewhere in the full, in the Pulga flea market somewhere for at least $3 so I can make $2 profit. And that $2 after volume, it can, it can add up that way I can, at least I can eat and pay my bills. That's the way I saw it. You see? So that's kind of what forces me to be like, man, fuck it. I don't got a social, but now I got to go ahead and grind it. I got to go ahead and get it somehow, somewhere. And that's why, again, one more time, America can give you the opportunity to go ahead and walk, go to Walmart and buy this for one dollars, and then go to go to actually business and be like, hey, look, I got this cup, the same cup, and I sell it to you for five dollars. Now the homeowner of that restaurant is not gonna say nothing because he's lazy to go to Walmart. Now you're bringing it to him for five dollars for a fee. See what I'm saying? And yeah. that's America. So it's in someone's. I hate when some people, oh, they're taking our job. I'm not taking nobody's job. I'm taking the job that you don't want to do. You don't want to go to Walmart and invest a dollar and then flip this for five dollars. But I'm willing to do it because why? Because I don't have a social. But you have a social and you're willing to go to McDonald's and get $7 an hour. Nothing against them. But you're willing to do that. You're not willing to go the out, outside the, the normal to make it out for your own. And that's what makes an American, that's what makes the immigrant, that what Gary Lee always says, is that was, that's what makes an immigrant an immigrant because we always, we have all the barriers, man, to get to a social security that we have to go all around it, around here, around here, around here to make a buck. To make a buck, you see, I get it. There's some, there's some of those that they go the different route, they go the legal way. Not me. I try always go the fine way. Okay, let me let me make it right. Let me make it right. Let me make my clean money, my clean money. I get it. There's some of those, but they're also the ones like me, where they're always trying to make the right, the right way, and make it legit. And like me, there's millions of them out here, man, that I know of. You know. Absolutely, it it makes you think outside the box. Outside the box, bro, all the time, like. Bro, I'm telling you, look, man, when I, uh, when I first, again, I got to America, didn't know anything, didn't know nobody. Man, I was so blessed this lady, dude. It was, uh, she was like, uh, she was a businessman. She owned like two buildings, right? And she will, she will divide, like, you know, Chicago is like building, three-story building, whatever, with basements and stuff. Well, she had, for, per, per building, she had like, like 15 rooms, bro, 15 rooms. So she will, she will rent the rooms to all the international students, right? So the international students, she will have two buildings. We're looking at about like 30, 30 rooms, bro. So you can't imagine the volume that this lady was making. She was like 70 years old already, dude. So one day, one day, dude, she comes and she tells me, Manny, I have uh, two students that are coming from Brazil. Do you mind showing them downtown? And I go, yeah, I don't mind showing them downtown. And she goes, yeah, I'll pay you $25 if you, if you can show them the, uh, the downtown. And I go, Man, she's willing to pay me $25 just to show them downtown. And it's just like going, get on the train, go, come back, $25. And I'm like, okay. 
dude, I did that. I made my 50 bucks. First 50 bucks I made in America, dude. I was like, in cash, here you go. Dude, and after that, I was like, what? Dude, she's getting, she's getting students like every week, bro. Every week. And I'm like, what if I can tell her that I will show, I will show her downtown to all the students that come in and she will pay me $25. Sure enough, bro. I go, hey, and her name was uh, Dennis. Hey, Miss Dennis, um, you know, with my broken English and everything. Hey, you know, if, if, if I can, you know, $25 per student and I help them good. She goes, yeah, do it, do it. I, I would like for you to do it because I want them to feel like, you know, they're being welcome in the house and somebody takes care of them and show them the city. Do before I know. I got five people at a time. Bro, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sunday, five people at a time. Move, come on, downtown, come back. Come back, downtown, 100 bucks each, each round. 100 bucks each round. Dude, I was making $300 a weekend. $300 a weekend. Dude, tax-free, no taxes, cash. I was like, man, this is it. So yeah. see, I had to go out of my comp because I couldn't go to a regular store, restaurant, mall. Hey, I want to work. Why? Because I don't have a social. Mm. And then what I did was I found out the opportunity. Okay, click. My entrepreneur mindset. Okay, this is it, bro. This is it. This is where you're going to make your money. Bro, $300 a week. That's what that's fourteen hundred. That's what twelve hundred dollars. Just and then, plus I was going to school only only working three days. Three days. Shit, I was I was I was cool. I was I was making it. You know, like I was. I felt like I was good. Dude. Like I was good. This is it. You know, <laughs> but but that's what it takes. You know, that's what it takes, and that's what a lot of people don't want to see. A lot of people are like, ah, no, I don't want to go with five people downtown. Shit, give me give me the five people. I take in, I showed them downtown. You know. Took me, took, me like, took me like five hours. That's it, dude, for a hundred bucks? Not bad. Not bad at all. Gee, for nobody that ha that is not el el eligible to, to work? Gee. Yeah, well, what, what do they say? That uh, you never lose an opportunity. It always goes to someone else. Exactly. There you go. There you go. There you go. So, yeah, man, long story short, bro, you know, you just always got to be willing to look for, you know, that what's next or – Okay, if it's here, let me step out, of, step out of it a little bit and let me look at it from the outside in. Or, okay, if I'm looking from the outside in, how can I make it better? I don't always, how can I be better? How can I make what, I, what I'm doing now better? See, always better, 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 and better. Because remember, there's no limit. There's no limit here. You can come up with the next Facebook tomorrow. And who's going to tell you no? Worst the scenario, uh, Zuckerberg's going to be like, hey, motherfucker, I don't want you to come up with the next Facebook. I'll buy you out. Five million. All right, fuck it. Five million. Take it. <laughs> Worst scenario, right? Like when Instagram came out, what did he do? He bought it. He bought it out because he knew, he was like, nah, man, this these people are gonna are gonna are gonna take the market. All right, three three billion. All right, fuck it, give me three billion. I take it all day, yeah. you know. But that is America. That's how it is. Yeah, as capitalism as, as it sounds, but that's how America was built. Look at look at, look at the history, bro. Rockefeller with the oil, Standard Oil, Andrew Carnegie with the steel. Right, Henry Ford with the cars, right? Now let's go back. What about Andrew uh, Vanderbilt with the train rails, right? When when there was cars were even were not even a thing, they were super expensive. So he people he would he would move people by train. Well, guess what? He monopolized all the train roads from coast to coast. So when you look at the history, it tells you this was built by businessmen. This was built by entrepreneurs. This was built by people that had more bigger vision. For example, again, one more time, Chicago. You look at Ali, when I used to live in Chicago, all those buildings, who do you think you built them? Andrew Carnegie, the steel, the metal. And the building is still 150 years old and they're still there. See? Yep. There's a lot to be said for, for learning about history because it not only tells us of the past, you know, it can, it, 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 it gives you an, an appreciation for things that, that you that you have. Yeah, yeah, it does. It definitely does, brother. It definitely does. So again, I'm, I always, I, I thank you, man. Thank you for, for reaching out because again, I always uh, like these opportunities to, to share my, my words and to share my experience, man. And um, you know, man, when nothing is shared, everything is possible. Yes, sir. Absolutely, yeah. Manny. Everything's possible. So what's, uh, what, what's next for you? What's next for me, bro, it's getting into now multifamily, getting into multifamily. I'm getting now into like, you know, 50 units, 100 units, you know, 200 units. That's what's next. You know, getting into syndication, actually buying them with, you know, our business partner, Michael, Charles, which are, you know, my mentors. 
um, you know, buying then us buying and, and then syndicated the whole, the apartments, right? Only, you know, 150 units, 200 units, 2000 units apartments all over Texas, not just sex all over the state where the opportunity comes, um, you know, also diversifying all other businesses such as online businesses, uh, you know, more of like going towards the digital, digital market type of deal. So that's, that's what's next. That's what's next. Absolutely. All right, Manny, you know, um, maybe someone's listening. They, they really find your story compelling. They really like it a lot. You know, how can we get a hold of you? Where can we find you? Sure, brother. Well, my best way to find me is on an IG. It's Manny Cash, Manny Cash HBHS, Manny Cash HBHS. That's I'm always active there. I'm always, you know, dropping some nuggets there. Uh, you can send me a DM on Facebook as Manny Cash Houses, Manny Cash Houses, same thing. I'm always there. And uh, that's, that's pretty much it, you know, with Home Buying, Home Selling Association. I'm always active answering people's questions, you know, whether it's call calling, real estate, contracts, offers, things like that. I'm, I'm, I'm an open book, you know, whatever people need help with, I'm here to help. And, uh, you know, let's just all make it together. I'm, I'm, I'm with the mindset of all, all of us. We can, if we, if we can get together, we can all make it together, you know, so. Yeah, absolutely, man. You know, we talked, we covered a lot of ground. I mean, we talked about, um, you know, a little bit about Venezuela. We talked about differences, you know, between Venezuela and America, the economy, uh, cold calling, different strategies, psychology. Sales. Man, that was, that was a lot of ground that we covered and uh, it was a lot of fun. I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, no, thank you, man. It's my pleasure. Anytime you want to know when you just let me know and I appreciate it, my man. I really do. Which is, uh, you know, tag me on. Just put me on, uh, on when you when you share the video. Make sure you tag me, and that way I can you know boost it out too. Of course, though. I'll put uh you know I'll put all those links in the description. Make sure to tag you. Um, yeah. No, no problem. But uh, Manny, you've been you. Thank you so much. You've been a terrific guest. Uh, I sure as heck learned a lot, not only about you but about your business, what you do, and uh, I know you have a real bright future ahead of you. So thank you. Thank you, bro. I appreciate it. And you stay safe. Okay, stay blessed. Bye. Bye-bye.